Today is Thursday, July 19, 2012. Mainstream media sources are saying that the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad could be toppled by rebel forces within days, three officials in his inner circle having been killed in a recent explosion. Last year, Webster Tarpley reported that the events in Syria do not resemble a civil war, and that he had spoken to people who claimed that death squads are sniping at civilians only for the purpose of destabilizing the country. Tarpley claims that these squads are backed by American, British, French, and Israeli intelligence agencies, funded by the Saudis, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar, and managed by former Syrian Foreign Minister Abdul Halim Kadam. Tarpley described Kadam as groomed by NATO as a new dictator. Kadam has been described as having been a loyalist of Bashar al-Assad's father Hafez. Tarpley says Syria is the most tolerant society in the Middle East and calls Assad a humanitarian. Israeli newspaper Haaretz describes Assad as an outspoken critic of Israel, reporting that he attributes his regime's strength to its opposition to that country. Israel's ambassador to the U.S. recently said, We do see a possible ouster of Mr. Assad as affording an opportunity to us. Fox News has reported that the U.S. is secretly funding the opposition in Syria in order to topple the Assad regime. Webster Tarpley claims that the CIA has extended an open invitation to criminals and terrorists in the region to come to Turkey to be trained to fight the Syrian army. According to YouTube reporter Rise Two Cents, last year there was a $10 billion deal for an Iran-Syria oil pipeline. Rival pipelines cannot be built if there are ongoing conflicts in Syria. The goal is a complete cessation of the flow of oil between Syria and Iran, and Turkish mercenaries are also helping to destabilize Syria. This month, Syria, Iran, China, and Russia are coordinating a military exercise in Syria, comprised of 90,000 troops, 900 tanks, 400 planes, and 12 naval ships, and taking place at sea, air, and land on Syrian soil. It is the largest joint exercise in Middle East history. In September, U.S. naval forces will be conducting minesweeping activities in the Persian Gulf. Some media figures have conjectured that the U.S. may send a decommissioned aircraft carrier to the Gulf to be destroyed in a false flag attack to be blamed on Iran. Russia has warned the NATO countries not to attack Iran and accused the Western powers of stirring up trouble in Syria. China and Russia have shown support of Syria and the U.N., and China and Pakistan have said that they would consider an attack on Iran as an attack on themselves, and have suggested that they would retaliate as such. China and Russia have nearly twice as many nukes combined as the U.S. does. Iran recently confirmed that its plan to close the Strait of Hormuz is ready to be put into action. This could triple, or even quadruple, crude oil and gas prices. Some reports claim that Obama and or Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu want to attack Iran's nuclear facilities in early October, around the beginning of the U.S. presidential debates. The King of Jordan has called for Assad to step down, and today the United Nations voted on a new resolution threatening non-military sanctions against Syria, which Russia and China vetoed. Additionally, yesterday, at least seven Israeli tourists were killed in a bus explosion in Bulgaria, for which Israel blamed Iran and vowed revenge. Hezbollah was also blamed for the attack, but denied that tourists would be worthwhile targets. What may play out, in a worst-case scenario, over the next three to twelve months is the following. One. Israel retaliates against Lebanon and or Iran over yesterday's Bulgarian bus bombing and or the U.S. stages an attack on one of its warships and blames it on Iran and or Israel stages an attack by Iran. 2. The NATO-Israeli alliance increases meddling and destabilization efforts in Lebanon, Syria and or Iran and or simply goes ahead and bombs Iran's nuclear facilities. 3. Either of the aforementioned actions will provoke a response from Iran, Syria, and or Lebanon, but the former action would be enough to provoke such a response, which could easily excuse Western destruction of Iran's nuclear facilities. 4. Being that an attack on Iran will be construed by Pakistan and China as an attack on themselves, those countries' forces would be deployed against whichever Western powers are, are perceived to have led the attack. Additionally, given the signals it has made so far, it wouldn't take much for Russia to become even more vociferous and threatening in asserting its, uh, its support of Iran. Being that Iran is nearly three times as populous as Iraq, occupation seems impossible, even in a concerted effort by all major Western powers. However, considering that Iran is virtually surrounded by U.S. military bases, 
most notably in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as a recent call by retired U.S. General Stanley McChrystal to reinstate the draft, there remains the possibility that the U.S. could declare an emergency and invoke various Patriot Act and continuity of government authorities to enact martial law, putting the country in a state of all-out total war of occupation against Iran and its would-be allies. Even if such an occupation ever occurs, the difficulty of invasion, and the fact that the nation's capital of Tehran is home to over a sixth of its population, suggest that nuclear or other heavy weaponry could be used against Tehran and other major cities. All in all, the divide between NATO and Israel, and Syria, Iran, Pakistan, China, and Russia, is sharpening at a frightening pace. In my opinion, the world is closer to intercontinental nuclear exchange and or a full-scale multinational military conflagration than any other time since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I expect this threat to ratchet up exponentially over the next three and a half months, leading to a cataclysm in the month of October, which could very well be virtually irreversible.